Hey guys, Nishquick here, and welcome back to another episode of Nishquick Talks. I haven't done one of these in a while, and I thought I had some free time today, so why not get on the camera and talk about my frustrations with Square Enix. This is a very interesting topic, and you guys might be wondering, this kind of came out of nowhere, but I have a lot to say about this, and there's been a lot of lead-up to me making this video based off of what's going on in the news and the video game industry and Square Enix's decisions and all that stuff and me also playing a lot more Square Enix and Squaresoft games which you guys might have seen on the channel with my Final Fantasy 7 and Final Fantasy 9 reviews and me just talking about Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth and 16 on Twitter and social media. So if you guys enjoy casual discussions like this, Nintendo, JRPG stuff, anything like that, Metaphor Refantasio as well which is a new game coming up, which I've been making content for, hit the like button, subscribe for more content like this. Also, big shout out to all you guys who've been watching the Metaphor stuff, I really appreciate it, I did not expect those two videos to blow up the way they did, but I really, really appreciate all the support. Anyways, I have a lot of notes that I had taken, just like I usually do for these casual discussions, so let's get right into it. I have sort of a interesting history with Square Enix and Squaresoft, I guess you could say. You guys might remember if you've seen my uh, Learning to Love Final Fantasy 7 video earlier this year. If not, you guys should check that out. It was a very fun video to make, one of my favorite videos that I've ever produced on this channel. In that video, I talk about how I started the original Final Fantasy 7, like, almost like five years ago in 2019 and it took me so long to get through the game and I finally beat it in December of this past year or like January of this year so very early in this year so that was my first taste into like Square Soft, Square Enix games and then after that I looked more into games like Chrono Trigger, Secret of Mana, all the rest of the Final Fantasy games but then the actual games that I really picked up and played were like uh, Kingdom Hearts 1.5, 2.5, also played a bit of uh, Dragon Quest 11 S. I never completed it though because played it on Game Pass and then it left Game Pass, but... And then I played Final Fantasy 7 Remake and Nier Automata, so more modern Square Enix games. So I got a taste of a little bit of their classic stuff with FF7, modern stuff with all of those games, and then I played the magnum opus, I finally played Chrono Trigger, really enjoyed it, and that was my really like first deep look into like what their retro classic stuff was. And then of course I did a Final Fantasy VII replay this year, and then I played one of my favorite Squaresoft games from like their classic era, which was Final Fantasy IX this year. So I'm really glad I played that, and I was planning to play Final Fantasy X this year, but I don't know if I'll have the chance to. We'll see whenever I get around to that, that's planned for next year. Another classic Squaresoft game that I played this year was the legendary Xenogears, and I'll be talking about that more in depth at the end of this video, but that's another s classic Squaresoft game that I had the pleasure to play. And then of course, uh, I played Final Fantasy 16 and Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth when those released on PlayStation 5. So that's a little bit of my history with Square Enix slash Squaresoft's games. But the reason I'm saying this is because me as a fan of RPGs now, and I've been playing a lot of these games, is even though I never really grew up playing those games back then, I can kind of sort of tell that there is a stark difference between the company that Square Soft was versus what Square Enix is now. And I'll be getting to that a little bit later, and that has to do with just the direction of games, the the audience they're trying to come across to, some of their business decisions when it comes to the games they're putting out, the games they're greenlighting, the games they're marketing, and that's a lot of what I wanted to talk about today, and a lot of where my frustrations are coming from. And if you guys feel the same way, you can let me know in the comments below. I know that this is a very hot topic very opinionated kind of thing. I know a lot of people are going to flat out disagree with me on this, and I really have seen that a lot on social media, a lot of people voicing opinions like this on YouTube as well. A lot of people just disagree. But even if you do disagree, I want to know in a nice and respectful manner if you can. Let me know in the comments below why you disagree and we can chat about it. So one thing I noticed when playing a lot of these PS1 classics, Final Fantasy 7, 9, Xenogears, of course, whenever I get around to Final Fantasy X, 
and I want to also play Chrono Cross and of course Chrono Trigger which I have played but Chrono Cross is one that I have on my radar as well. One of the things I've noticed about these games is they had a lot of limitations in the hardware, in the technical specs, in the resources, in the people developing them, in just the technology that was around at that time. They had a lot of limitations, but that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. You see, a lot of the creativity, a lot of the mind-blowing amazement and wonder that came from these games that I'm noticing, and I'm hearing like other people talk about who played them back in the day, and what I'm also noticing in the present day, which makes these games timeless, is the limitations that these games had made the developers get so much more creative with what they could do in these games. Like, all the amazing cinematography and set pieces that I saw in Xenogears, the way they used 3D in that game in ways that no other video game was doing back then, the way each scene in Final Fantasy IX had a very striking kind of pre-rendered background that was so unique to that specific location, that specific frame, and that specific moment in the story, the scenario that they built with these games, like climbing up Mount Corel and approaching the summit to where Barrett's hometown was, and venturing through the City of the Ancients to finally see that iconic moment in Final Fantasy VII. Of course, these moments were recreated very beautifully in this year's Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, but just seeing what they could do with 1997 hardware back then and make it so believable, so creative, so beautiful, and so immersive, it's I think it's honestly more mind-blowing than anything I've seen now with modern PlayStation 5 hardware. And that just speaks to the level of creativity of the geniuses back then, like Sakaguchi, Tetsuya Takahashi, Yoshinori Kitase, Tetsuya Nomura, so many of those people who worked on these games. But what do I see from Square Enix in the 2020s, specifically the 2020s, because that's when I started to notice some problems and, and some things that started to kind of like frustrate me a bit. So the first thing I have right here is budgets ballooning out of control. Like I've been hearing a lot of people talking about how Final Fantasy 16 was such an expensive game and you, you see these icon boss fights and they're great. They're some of the greatest boss fights I've ever experienced in video games like Titan, Bahamut, Odin, all these are so cool but then you think about how much time money and resources went into those fights alone those specific boss fights and some of them were fantastic like i think titan and bahamut were a lot of fun because you're actually like involved in those fights but then others didn't necessarily feel scripted but weren't as involved and then you think about how much time money resources were spent into those fights and then you think about the rest of final fantasy 16 you're like could have spread out that kind of time a little bit more, spent a little more time on other parts of the game, and maybe would have made the game a little bit better. And I want to get this statement made first before I continue on with the rest of the video, because I will be making a little bit of criticisms here and there about certain games like Final Fantasy VII Remake, Final Fantasy XVI, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, so on and so forth, games like that. I will be making criticisms, observations, analyses, and giving my opinion on some aspects of these games. But I want to make it known that I really enjoyed these games. I enjoyed them, I had fun with them, I played them from beginning to end, did a lot of the side content, and I thought the games were fun. But there are some aspects which I hope are changed for the betterment of us as gamers and JRPG fans and for the betterment of Square Enix because I just don't feel like it's feasible and sustainable for them to keep making games like this. So my criticisms should not be confused with, how do I say this, uh, hatred and animosity towards some of these games. So I just wanted to get that said first before anything else. And yeah, budgets are always ballooning out of control with various series and various games. You see 
like <laughs> the most notable example is like that game Concord, which cost four hundred million dollars, and it was just an absolute waste of time, money, resources, all that stuff. But then you see Square Enix games, like even Rebirth. Rebirth probably cost a lot to make with how the environments are laid out, the character models, the realism, the fidelity, all that stuff. It takes a lot of time and money. Like, I, it never really hit me how much of a time sink de video game development is and how much of a money sink it is as well until I started to really look into this stuff like especially last year and this year and seeing how Square Enix is really doubling down on this stuff and then here's what I wanted to get into next seeing them doubling down onto all these like high fidelity things big budget things big like set pieces and all that stuff and then the sales don't necessarily reflect a lot of that. That's not really good and it's kind of disappointing actually. If they don't reach their target sales or their target for whatever they want to make back with these games, then it's going to be tough for them to potentially green light future games that are similar to this, or they're gonna have to even like rethink the conventions of what a Final Fantasy game or a Square Enix game is going to be. Well, not all of this is Final Fantasy's fault, because Square Enix has been doing a lot of other things that have been frustrating me, like, of course, many games that I just don't know why they even greenlit to begin with, like Foam Stars. I remember seeing that in that one PlayStation showcase and I was like, dude, this is Discount Splatoon. What is this? This is not what I expected Square Enix to do. And that's not their only like live service game they've doubled down onto. Like, remember that Avengers game? I was in quite the Avengers phase back then, like during Infinity War and Endgame. And I saw that, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like a high fidelity Avengers game. And then I realized it was live service and I was like, no, I'm not interested anymore. And then I saw it was Square Enix. I was like, Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics, who would have thought that they would be in charge of this game? But that was them, and it was not a very successful game, and we can kind of see what that's led to. And not only that, I'm sure you guys remember the disaster that was that game, Babylon's Fall. Like, why, why were they doing this? And then remember, once, or I think twice, New Year's Day of 2022 and 3 or 2021 and 2022 or something like that, the CEO was like, we're gonna double down on NFTs and live service games and blockchain games and the metaverse and all that. And I'm like, you guys are trend chasing. You guys are chasing trends that you don't even know, like, what you're gonna do with it. Like, they're like, oh, let's chase the live service trend. And then they made three games that just kind of flopped. They, I think they made a mobile NFT game. And I heard about it for like one day. I saw someone like make a negative review about it for like one day. And then I never heard about it ever again. Imagine doubling down on those kinds of games and then expecting so much, but then you don't even know what you're doing with them. And you just misread the room and you kind of just fail a lot of this like negative publicity we might see about Square Enix like oh their sales are lower their projections are lower like things like that their shareholders aren't happy it's not always to do with Final Fantasy or any of their like big budget like first party games a lot of the times it's to do with this stuff and that like lends into my frustration. I'm like, guys, why are you doubling down on these kinds of games? And then there's also Forspoken. I don't know if you guys remember Forspoken. Forspoken gets me into another kind of aspect with Square Enix and it's their marketing. Like Forspoken was good in the sense that it was a single player game trying new things like with magic instead of like melee combat. I like the first few trailers, I thought it was pretty cool. But then I realized like, this is just kind of trend chasing again, but also like trying to trend chase into like the Western market, make it more appealing to Western gamers and things like that. And I'm like, yeah, you could, but it's it was just a little cringy here and there and just overall not really the best game. But I remember during that time leading up to uh, Forspoken, there's so many other games that they're putting out like, 
Harvest Stella, Dio Field, and uh, Neo The World Ends With You. I, don't, I think that was a little bit earlier, but like a lot of these double A games, they're just throwing them out there and just kind of throwing them out to die. And then I think the biggest example was very close to the release of Forspoken was also Octopath Traveler 2. And they were going so hard on the Forspoken marketing and they just kind of left the other games to just kind of like, oh yeah, by the way, this, this game is happening. By the way, yeah, this game is happening. And I felt like for some of these games like Harvest Stella and Octopath Traveler 2, I felt like Nintendo did more of the marketing than Square Enix did. And I was like, that's so weird. Like, why are you throwing so many games out there all at once? not spacing them out and not properly marketing them because especially these double a games like these team asano games or these remasters and remakes like tactics ogre and um crisis core and then these like new ips like harvest stella they're very good to have they're very good to sustain your company and sustain your brand as square enix like this very prominent rpg publisher and developer studio and you just kind of throw them out willy-nilly and don't even let them have the chance to like show themselves and get in front of the eyes of potential players and fans like why i, I just don't understand that and, and speaking of the appeal to western gamers like that's that's good like cast your net wide and try to appeal to as many people as possible but i sometimes feel when they do that they often cast their net not wide but they kind of cast their already small net into another direction like imagine there's the fans of rpgs here and then there's the western fans here they're throwing the net all the way here they're not like throwing it on both sides they're only trying to appeal to one kind of audience and I'm not saying Final Fantasy 16 did that or anything. Some games here and there did, and some aspects of some games did that here and there. But I just feel like if they know that they have a loyal fan base, remember to keep that loyal fan base there, but also bring in other people with other design elements, other story elements, other gameplay elements, and don't alienate any other already existing fan base as well. That's just something I've noticed over the past years at Square Enix. So I already talked quite a bit about my opinions and thoughts about some of the Final Fantasy games in this video, but in this part of the video I want to go into detail on some of the, I guess you can say, issues that people are seeing with the latest Final Fantasy games and give my thoughts and opinions on it and kind of incorporate that into how that factors into all my frustrations regarding Square Enix and all that stuff. But anyways, I remember last year, I remember this very vividly, I really strongly remember this, when 16 didn't necessarily meet sales expectations, people were analyzing it, seeing like, Hey, what went wrong? Was it an exclusive on PS5? Was it because of this? Was it because of that? Was it because they spent so much money into this game they're not seeing enough of a return? Did it not sell properly? Did it not sell well? Was the marketing not good? Was the direction of the game not good? Did they focus too much on action instead of a turn-based game? At first, I had a lot of preconceived like opinions going into this. I was like, oh, I don't know about the action stuff. I really hope that there is some more RPG stuff in this. It's too linear, this, that, and the other. And then I played the game and I enjoyed it. I really liked a lot of what they did in the game. I liked the story, the characters, and it still had that kind of Final Fantasy vibe that I knew from other games that I had played since before 16. And then I heard from other people as well, like this still feels like a tried and true Final Fantasy game. But I remember a lot of people analyzing the sales of that game, seeing how it didn't perform as well compared to even a game like Pikmin 4, like I remember Pikmin 4 and FF16 came out around the same time and I remember Pikmin 4 doing like a lot better and of course totally different kind of game, totally different audience, totally different platform as well. But people were saying like if a Final Fantasy game which is as high of a caliber, like Final Fantasy, like 
big brand, like a legacy franchise, Final Fantasy, if that's not like comparing to something like Pikmin, and if it's selling around the same as a newer franchise, a newer RPG franchise like Xenoblade, which is not a legacy franchise like Final Fantasy. Like, Xenoblade has the Xeno prefix and the Xeno thing backing it up, but like, Xenoblade is relatively new. It's fairly new and it's only recently gotten a lot of the popularity behind it. Like, even the other Xeno games like Xenosaga, Xenogears, Xenoblade 1 even, Xenoblade X, like these games, like everything before Xenoblade 2 was still a little more niche. And Xenoblade is still more niche than something like Final Fantasy, but now seeing a game like Final Fantasy 16 or Rebirth sell within that kind of range of Xenoblade was interesting to see. Like that, again, I want to remind you guys, that is not reflective of how I think these games are in terms of their quality or anything. Like, I still loved Final Fantasy 16, I enjoyed it. I'm looking to maybe even do a replay on my PC. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which I'll talk about in a bit, was probably my game of the year up until maybe Metaphor Refantasia. We'll, we'll see. I haven't even, like, I've only beaten the demo of Metaphor. I'll wait till I beat the entire game of Metaphor, then I'll make a decision on which one's goatee. But um, as of now, like, Rebirth was, like, one of the best RPG experiences I've had in a long time. But then, you also see things like Rebirth, like, they're splitting this remake into three parts. They're spending so much time and so many resources, so many devs, so much development resources, so much money, so much, so much development time into this. And it's it's interesting. I, I remember a lot of people who, like, I've talked to who are, like, legacy Final Fantasy VII fans all the way back, 1997. They were, like, teenagers when they played the game. And then they realized that Remake is in three parts, and they kind of like dipped in the first game. They're like, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. I, I wanted like a, one full game, start to finish, from Midgar till like the end of the game where you fight Sephiroth. That's it. Like, that's what I want the game to be. And that's not what we're getting. And the thing is, I, as a newer Final Fantasy fan and a newer Final Fantasy VII fan, I kind of appreciate this because they can expand the games, they can kind of fix some story stuff which I didn't like with the original, like I don't have that attachment with the original, but I'm now starting to like see why people felt that way. And the biggest thing is, is since it's three parts, it's kind of like you have to go in order, you have to play the original, you have to play Crisis Core, you have to understand this and that and that, you have to, it's a lot of work to get into this game, to get into the series, and to get into just one installment. Like, for Rebirth, of course I played Remake, but after playing Remake, I was still confused. I was like, who is that guy with the black hair? Why was this happening? Why was Cloud doing this? Why was this? Why was this? And then I played the original, then I was like, oh, okay, I understand, I understand, this, that, and the other. And then, before Rebirth, I had to play Crisis Score, I had to watch Advent Children, I had to read up a bit on Dirge of Cerberus because of the DLC for Final Fantasy VII Remake. It's just not approachable, like, when you think about it. And I remember one of my friends played Final Fantasy VII Remake this year, and I just, I didn't tell him much because I was like, oh, he's enjoying it, he's having a good time. And then he got to the end, and he was like, okay, I don't think I like this game anymore. And I'm like, why? And he's like, it just got too convoluted, it just took a totally different turn. I thought this is the end of the game, but it doesn't seem like it's the end. And that's when I told him, I was like, yeah, they're doing the story in three parts. This is not the end of Final Fantasy VII. And then, like, that dwindled his interest. And similarly, like, I showed one of my friends, like, the Titan boss fight, like, on YouTube for Final Fantasy XVI, and he was, like, mind blown. He's like, oh my god, you can do all this stuff, like, it's so cool. And I was like, yeah, this is Final Fantasy XVI, dude, you should get this on PC when it comes out. And he was like, XVI? What about the other 15 games? And, like, I remember, like, I got XVI for my birthday, my friends got it for me, and I was playing it, and some of my other friends was like, so 16, right? So do all these games connect? And I'm like, oh no, they don't connect. You can jump in wherever you want. And I was expecting that to be kind of like 
more enticing for him, like more approachable. Oh, you can jump into any Final Fantasy game. But that made him more confused. He was like, then why are they Final Fantasy? Why are they even called Final Fantasy games? Like, what is the connecting tissue that like kind of makes them Final Fantasy? And that's when I got confused as well. It's like, oh, they have similar monsters, they have similar summon abilities, they have similar attacks and similar characters, and he was like, that's it? That's all they have that are the same? And that's when it hit me, I was like, I think what the series needs is consistency. Because imagine going from like Final Fantasy X, which was purely turn-based, to Final Fantasy XII, which is like in sort of like a Xenoblade kind of MMO. I haven't played XII yet, so correct me if I'm wrong. But And then thirteen was like a mesh of like a whole bunch of other things. Fourteen was a failed MMO, now it's like a very, very successful MMO, which is doing very well, so that's great. And then going from that to fifteen, which was more, a little bit more action, and then sixteen, which is like a very different style of action, but Devil May Cry style of action. But then having this Final Fantasy VII remake style, which is a blend of 13 and a little bit of like 15 and a little bit of 7 all kind of mixed into one. Sure, there's some consistency, there's some similarities, but there's no like one defining thing that makes Final Fantasy a Final Fantasy. I remember when 16 came out, everyone was saying, what makes a Final Fantasy a Final Fantasy is like an RPG experience that defines that generation, that is so like good, so big, so grand in scope, that it just defines that generation. But with the way video games are going now, with how expensive it is to make games, how high development costs are, how like just long it takes to make something at that level, I don't know if Final Fantasy can be that anymore. And it's a very sad thing to think about but also I just that that's just what I'm noticing like imagine waiting eight to ten years for the next Final Fantasy to top what Final Fantasy 16 and what remake part 3 is going to be is it even worth it my thing is should they scale back and focus more on consistency to maintain the brand instead of making like this big huge new thing every single console generation and that's what is reflective in these sales like you're seeing like the brand is dwindling the sales are dwindling the sales aren't meeting the mark of course console exclusivity is part of the problem being stuck on ps5 is part of the problem you're like eliminating the entire nintendo switch user base, you're eliminating the entire PC user base by not releasing games on PC day one, like, that, that was so confusing to me, like, why are you not releasing, like, Rebirth and 16 on PC day one, like, I can wait for these games and just get them straight on PC, honestly, like, that that's another really confusing thing, just maximize your reach a little bit, like, remember when I said, like, casting their net wide, of course, cast your net wide would perspective like fans and like potential newer fans but also cast your net wide with people who are on different platforms so they can play on whatever platform they want to play on and I think the launch of the next generation Nintendo console is going to really like make them realize hey we gotta like hop on this we gotta hop on this stuff real quick I I'm fine with 7 remake being in three parts and I am forgiving of them of doing that because, like I said, you have so many set of Final Fantasy VII titles, you have this giant compilation, so it's a good idea for this remake project to kind of bring everything together, and it seems like that's what they're doing, but I saw, like, this quote from, um... Naoki Yoshida or Yoshi P saying like, oh, if we do Final Fantasy IX Remake, we have to do it in three parts or multiple parts because it's such a big game. And I'm like, if you do that for nine, then I'm, I'm done. I'm out. Because like, if you do it for things that don't need it, like you can argue that seven doesn't need it. But I say seven, like it sort of benefits from it because like you're getting a little more of like extra time with the characters from the compilation and extra lore from the compilation. But 9 is just 9. Final Fantasy 9 is Final Fantasy 9 and that's it. And yeah, they're making like some animated TV show, but that's not even out yet. So don't like 
forcefully make a remake in three parts when you don't need to, it's just gonna alienate your fans and it's gonna be weird and like, I don't know. We're really far into this video already, but I want to talk about what I think about Xenogears right now. The whole, like, thing that- the whole bit of news that prompted me to make this video in the first place is that Square Enix recently tweeted this thing about like them selling Xenogears watches and I was like- when I first saw that I was like, what? What is this? And like, I, I'm no stranger to Xenogears merch, like I've only- I'm a new Xenogears fan but I've seen so many pieces of merch for all the gears and the characters like Bard and Welltall and Andravi and Brigandir and all these like different like things like there's so much Xenogears merch that Square Enix is putting out there and now they're putting out watches. Th this is what frustrates me the most like you have this game, you have this IP, you have fans who are willing to go out of their way to tell you multiple times, YouTube comments, Twitter replies, dedicated YouTube videos telling you, Square Enix, that we want a remake, and you're just ignoring that and doing this instead. So like, that makes me frustrated, and that, that makes you question like, what is, what is the point? Like. If, if you don't want us to support you, like, no one's buying these watches. Like, I want, I want to know exactly who these watches are for and who's gonna buy them, because no one in their right mind who is, like, a legitimate Xenogears fan, like, I, I may be making assumptions, like, there's some crazy fanaticals on Xenogears probably, but no sane Xenogears fan who is excited for a remake and wants a remake is gonna support Square Enix by saying, we want a remake so we're gonna buy these watches. Like, no, they're overpriced. They're nothing relating to Xenogears, like, in any value. Like, why? I, I don't want anything like that. I want a remake. If, if there's a remake, I'll probably buy it on all platforms because I'm just that excited for a potential Xenogears remake. But I, I always talk about it as if, like, it doesn't exist and it's never gonna happen. So that's my mindset going into it like it's probably not gonna happen because they're acting this way they're selling all this stuff instead of green lighting a remake and the only silver lining i see for a xenogears remake is the fact that they greenlit a successful and very nice very visually beautiful star ocean 2 remake last year and if they get that development studio gem drops to work with Mr. Takahashi and his wife Kaori Tanaka to make a Xenogears remake, fully developing out disc 2, consulting them very closely, then hell yeah, just do it Square Enix. Don't release these unnecessary watches and unnecessary merch. Stop frustrating me <laughs> in like so many ways like I had talked about in this video. And on top of that, doing this, like just, just come on, like wake up, wake up. And like, not only all the things that I said in this video, there's like, one other thing that I remember just now is like, yeah, like, put your games on PC day one, Final Fantasy 16, Remake, Rebirth, Final Fantasy 9, like, put all that stuff on PC day one, as well as like, Xbox, Switch, Switch 2, like, put it all on everything day one. Like, that may not be part of the problem of like, the sales declining and all that. That might be one of the, like, factors going into it, but like, just do it, yeah, put it all on everything day one. But if you put your games on PC, at least optimize them properly. Like, I, I saw a lot of problems with Final Fantasy XVI's PC port. I saw a lot of problems with how it was not even, like, optimized at all for Steam Deck. Like, come on, like, look at Atlas, how they stepped up. They saw the unoptimized state of Metaphor Fantasia, and they went in and patched it and made it perfect. Like. I was excited for that 16 PC port, and I'll still get it, but I'm gonna wait for them to hopefully patch it out on Steam Deck, because, like, handheld stuff is, it's, it's important for me. It's how I play a lot of my video games, so that's another grievance and frustration that I have. So, if you guys are still listening, please let me know in the comments below. I know this is gonna be a very hot topic, very controversial video. I know I made a video similar to this last year, which I'm not very proud of, so I'm kind of, I'm 
like I'm just putting this out there because I'm just like rambling and I'm just talking about how I feel but I can see myself kind of looking back at this video like next year and not being so proud of it but we'll see. Maybe things might not be that way, maybe Square Enix will cheer me up by releasing a Xenogears remake so let me know what you think of everything I said in the comments below. What do you guys think about Square Enix as a development studio because like I like a lot of their games like I said. 16, Remake, Rebirth, Kingdom Hearts, Dragon Quest, like, they're good games, but, like, I feel like a lot of the decisions, a lot of the business decisions that they're making, a lot of the overall decisions for their IP and brand, I, I feel like companies like Monolith Soft are, like, up there now. Like, Atlas, sure, they make some silly business decisions as well, but... They're like, I feel like Atlas and Monolith Soft are like the top dogs for JRPGs for me right now. And then, of course, like, I'm gonna be dipping my toes into the Falcom games like this coming year. So, I've heard some very good things about them as well. So, we'll see what I think about them. I, I'm not like making this video to hate on any games or any Square Enix like devs or the company as a whole, but. There are just some frustrations that I've been experiencing and I just wanted to like vent and talk about them with you guys. So let me know what you thought about all this in the comments below and don't forget to give this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more Nintendo and RPG content like this. This is Nishquick signing off, have a great day, go play some great games today like a Square Enix game or better yet play a Squaresoft game like play uh, Xenogears, Final Fantasy IX, Chrono Cross, something like that like that Squaresoft charm. It's never gonna go away. I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. Hey guys, this is Nishquick. Thank you so much for watching that video. And if you enjoyed it, check out these two videos on the left and maybe subscribe if you haven't on your way out. And big shout out to all my channel members whose names you can see on the screen right now. I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.